Hey, this is Brock Lemires, and in this video, I'm going to talk about computer terminology and focus specifically on computer hardware. Okay, so let's begin with some definitions of computer terminology. Uh, one of the first questions that is interesting to ask when you're first learning how to program or build uh, circuits that go into computers is what is a computer? A lot of people don't really think about what it is. Uh, we're able to program a computer without really understanding what's going on underneath. We're able to build digital circuits without really seeing how they fit into the bigger picture of a computer. So stepping back every once in a while and thinking about like what is a computer is very helpful uh, in things like learning how to program because it gives us context. So the definition of a computer is a collection of hardware and software working together to accomplish a task. And that sounds kind of simple, but it's important to understand that the computer hardware is predetermined. Somebody has designed that and it is fixed. However, it has the ability to perform a set of what we call instructions or tasks, not even tasks, but just very simple operations. And you tell it which operations to execute and in which order and in which kind of looping structure using a set of instruction codes that you give to it or operation codes. And the codes that you provide to it, the hardware to tell it what to do is the software. Okay, and so hardware by itself doesn't do anything. Uh, software by itself doesn't exist. It's only when you take this sequence of operation codes and give it, to put it into the hardware, and tell it do these operations in this order is when the computer actually starts doing something. Okay, so an operation code is a binary code, ones and zeros, that defines what operation the computer hardware is going to execute at that time. Okay, we also call this an instruction. Instruction. So, and instructions are very simple. They're things like load information from memory into a CPU register or a CPU storage device. Take information from a CPU storage device and put it out to a port. Or take two binary numbers and add them. These instructions are very simple. They're much more simple than you would ever imagine until you actually get into the computer hardware. But when you run a whole bunch of them and you put them in a sequence that's very uh, kind of smartly designed, that's when the computer can execute things that are very complicated. And it's able to do this because it runs extremely fast. So millions and millions millions of, of operations or millions and millions of instructions are executed per second. So when you look at the computer hardware, it has this thing called an instruction set. And that is the group of instructions that have been implemented in hardware that that particular computer can implement. So you can have, if you had a load into a register from memory, a store information into memory and add, you could say that the, the computer had three instructions in its instruction set. And so whenever you start programming a computer at a very low level, one of the first things you do is you pull the data sheet on the computer and say, what are the instructions that I actually have at my disposal and then that influences how you program at a low level now we are going to program at a high level uh, using a language such as C and so we don't have to understand exactly what's going on but the more you understand the lower level operational hardware the better kind of programmer you are in C for specific applications okay so like we said software is simply a sequence of instructions that are executed one by one to accomplish a task. And you can imagine that you take all these instructions and you put them in order and they will run instruction one, instruction two, instruction three, instruction four, etc. And that does something. But you can also define the instructions to do things like repeat. So you could loop over and over and over, or you could selectively execute instructions. So you could jump over a set of instructions and execute another uh, group of instructions. And that gives us the ability to perform decision statements. Okay, so when you take all these instructions and you design them in the order that they're going to operate, that is called the program. So a program is nothing more than a set of instructions that are intelligently designed and inserted and in, in basically given to the computer hardware and say, okay, this is what you're going to execute. Those instructions themselves don't change, right? The instructions are built into the hardware. It's just the order of operations of how you want them to be executed that gives it the ability to be programmed, okay? So the person that 
creates those instructions, basically the instruction uh, kind of sequence and order that they're going to get executed to accomplish a specific task, that's your programmer. Okay, so that's your software developer, you can call it software engineer, but that there's a person that actually develops the software, but that software needs to understand what the hardware can actually operate. Okay, now the computer hardware, it provides all the necessary functionality to not only store the program that you're gonna create, but also execute all of those instructions. So there has to be a lot of stuff going on in the hardware to basically read whatever op code or operation code you have, understand what it is, know what you wanna do, and move information all around the computer in order to actually accomplish a task. Hardware is physical. So when you say computer hardware, it is something you can touch, right? It's the physical components in the system. They're almost always created with integrated circuit technology. So you see these little black chips right here. These are always, you know, there's millions and millions of transistors on there that implement all the computer functionality, but they're physical components in the computer. All right, so let's look a little bit deeper into computer hardware. All right, program memory. Down in the bottom right, you're going to see an architecture of a standard computer. This is the most basic computer where you have groups of functionality in kind of these common little blocks. And on the left, you're going to see something called the central processing unit. And we'll go into that in a second. On the right, you're going to see storage information and your input and output. But let's walk through the major components of this. The first thing you need in a, comp in a computer is program memory. Program memory refers to where you're going to put all of the instruction codes or the op codes uh, that implement your program. So once you figure out the sequence of instructions that you're going to use, they need to go somewhere so that they're stored. That goes into program memory. Okay. When the computer executes, it treats this as read-only memory. So your program sits down here. You don't overwrite it uh, during operation, okay? So you don't like go in and say, well, I have, I want to do instructions A, B, C, and then you accidentally go in and blow away your instructions during your program. You don't do that. The computer or the operating system, the computer will not allow you to do that, all right? If you have a computer such as like a Windows or a Mac, uh, a lot of the, well, most of the, uh, all of the programs programs are actually stored on non-volatile memory, which means when you turn off the computer, they stay there. Now, it's a little bit more advanced to talk about how you how a modern computer like brings non-volatile into volatile memory into RAM and cache and stuff like that. That's a different course. But for now, you can just think of a standard computer as you have a program memory block that is, let's call it, let's call it protected or read only read only during operation. Okay, so now <clears throat> let's take a look at the next block, which is gonna be data memory. So you, if you've ever thought about writing a program or what you might do, adding two numbers, uh, manipulating a, a set of numbers, you need temporary storage space, okay? And this is what we call variables, all right? So you have a thing called data memory, <clears throat> which is where you can temporarily store information. So when you write a program, you can be like, I need, I need 10 locations to store information. Can you please allocate me 10 locations in data memory? And that's where you set up all your variables. Okay, so these are set up at, there's, you have the ability to set up uh, storage and data memory when your program first runs. You also have the ability to dynamically allocate it based upon what's going on in the program. A lot of times we call this RAM memory, but it's, RAM stands for random access memory, which isn't actually, it, it is true that this is RAM, random access memory, but program memory today is usually random access also. So some of the things, <clears throat> whenever you hear somebody say RAM, they're almost always talking about data memory, even though RAM is a term that can be used for a bunch of other types of memory too. Okay, so over here is the central processing unit. This block is responsible for reading the instruction codes or the op codes out of your program memory, figuring out what to do with them or what the instruction is, and then how you're going to actually move information around to accomplish the task. It contains storage registers in here, it contains circuitry to perform operations, and it performs the finite state machine that actually walks through this fetch decode execute. So 
So in a computer, you have a finite state machine, this big finite state machine that's called the control unit. And it really is. It's the master controller of what is going on in the computer. So it is what knows how to execute all the instructions in the instruction set. And it has kind of this three block, not kind of like three phase uh operation it's you have a fetch you have a decoder and an execute the fetch refers to when you go out and grab the phys the actual binary operation code of the instruction from from program memory you grab that you have to do this this each time because you need to know what the next instruction is so you grab it look at it and that's the decode state and you say oh this was binary code 1101 that means we're going to do this instruction so once you decode it then you do an execution step which is where you go through a variety of states in order to actually accomplish what that instruction is so this this uh, state diagram on the left is is kind of descriptive of what you see you have this common fetch kind of phase where you grab the operation code then you have this common decode stage where you look at what it is and then it gets directed into an execution path the path in a finite state machine is a sequence of states and it's custom for that instruction but you can think of each instruction as a parallel path down this uh, state diagram so each path down here represents one unique instruction so this might be instruction a this path is instruction b this is instruction c and you just keep adding and adding and adding but this is where you can really see that the hardware of the computer is built in like the instructions that you can execute are hard coded in circuitry this is a finite state machine this is the way you know exactly what you think of a finite state machine registers and combinational logic it's built into the cpu you can't change this all you can do is provide different instruction codes to tell this finite state machine to walk through different paths in order to accomplish a more complicated task okay you are going to need some storage elements in your computer hardware in order to help you pull this off. Okay. These are called registers. <clears throat> now a register is a fast storage device and it's implemented with a device called a D flip flop. Okay. Or in a D flip flop is basically a storage device that stores based upon the edge of an incoming clock. So we call this a synchronous storage device and you can gang together a bunch of D flip flops and make eight, bits of storage or an 8-bit register you can gang 16 together or 32 together and you can store these words of information all at one time okay and in a cpu <clears throat> you're going to have some registers that are dedicated to doing nothing but helping you fetch and decode the instructions <clears throat> and execute the instructions and you're going to have some that are called general purpose registers that are up to you to use so if you want to like store information in a register go for it you might have register a b and c or register R3, R4, R5, you can actually have instructions that put information in there and then use that information in a later instruction, okay? All right, so let's go through the main registers that exist in computer hardware. <clears throat> okay, number one, you're going to have this, this register called a program counter. This it really is holding an address of where in program memory you are currently executing instructions. So it holds an address. You can think of it as a pointer. It's pointing to an address in program memory of where that instruction is. And if you think about it, you need to keep track where you're executing, right? So you're going to have instructions packed into this program memory one after another. You need some way to track, like, am I at the first instruction? And then after I do that, where's the next instruction? And where's the next instruction? So the program counter is what does that. It tracks what instruction you are executing in program memory. The next one is called stack pointer, a stack pointer. We talked about data memory as a, a way to kind of set up fixed variables when your program runs, but also give you the ability to set up dynamic variables or dynamic memory allocation. The stack pointer is what allows you to do that. So a stack pointer is, is another address uh, register. So it holds an address and it's pointing to a portion of the data memory, which allows you to essentially dynamically store information and pull information on. 
on there. So we use terms like push and, and pop. So you push information on and pop information off. And what happens is that the stack pointer will track where you pushed your last piece of information onto the into data memory. And then when you pull it off or pop it off, it'll actually move to the prior location. So it dynamically tracks where you're pushing and, pu and popping information into this uh, data memory structure. Okay, the status register is a register that actually tracks results. So you might perform an add and you might be concerned about whether or not a carry occurred. Well, the carry is a flag or a bit that will sit in your status register. You might be concerned about if you're going to perform subtraction that a two's complement overflow may have occurred. So that is a bit within the status register. The four most common bits in your status register are carry, two's complement overflow, whether the result was negative or whether the result was zero. But there's a bunch of other status flags in here that track other things in this computer, such as is it in low power mode? Are you allowing interrupts and all this other complicated stuff that we'll get to in another class, but that's the status register. Then you have the instruction register. The instruction register is where when you fetch the operation code, the op code, that needs to go somewhere while you decode it. So we put that in the instruction register. So instruction A is red and it has an op code of like hex A. When that fetch gets done, hex A is sitting right there. Then you decode it, execute it. Then you go fetch the next instruction. Let's say the next instruction is instruction B and it has an operation code of hex C. Well, <clears throat> it's gonna go fetch that code and put it in the instruction register. So those are the, the dedicated registers that you need to actually go grab the information and decode it. Then you just have regular general purpose registers and, and each computer has a, a number of these. Some of them are very small, like one or two. Some will provide you 32 registers up to 64 registers. And so this is kind of like just fast storage that you can use in your instructions, in your program. Okay, then you have the ALU, the arithmetic logic unit. This is a set of combinational circuitry that performs math and logic operations. So you know that like a CPU is going to be able to do math, right? I mean, computers do math. Well, the math that it can do is coded already. It's designed into circuitry that exists in the CPU. So if you had a computer and you said, I want it to be able to add, you would have to build an adder circuit and that adder circuit would have to go somewhere. So we group it in this block called the ALU. You. If you wanted the ability to invert all the bits in a, in a word, that would have to be logic that sits somewhere. We put that in there. So if you're going to have instructions that perform math, like add, subtract, multiply, invert, shift, all that stuff, all that circuitry has to be predetermined, pre-designed, and pre-implemented, and we group it into this arithmetic logic unit. So that is what gives the CPU the ability to actually manipulate uh, values. Okay. Now we have not talked about getting any information to the outside world. All we've talked about is your program goes in program memory. You use the control unit to fetch and decode it and you use these registers to kind of help do that. And then you can manipulate data, but nothing has ever gone to the outside world. So the way you get to the outside world in a computer is called an input output system or a port. So up here, you're gonna have ports that allow you to, let's say, write to a screen, uh, read from a keyboard, or even simpler things like uh, light up LEDs or read from buttons and read from switches, but those all happen within a port. And you can have different types of ports. You can have a parallel port where like you write an eight bit piece of information and all eight bits come out on pins of the computer, or you can have a serial port where those eight bits would be shifted out one at a time in order to reduce the number of pins and so there's all types of ports parallel ports and serial ports are kind of the most common and then you see different protocols on on how you get information in and out of the computer okay in between the cpu and the uh, and the kind of memory system and io is a bus system so you have a bunch of wires that shift information or move information from the cpu over here to the memory and back you're going to have an address bus that comes across so that you can provide an address to the memory system you're going to have a data back data in bus you're going to have a data out bus and then you're going to have control lines that kind of configure how everything operates all right you certainly have memory address bus memory data bus and memory map 
the memory data bus is what we just talked about. Memory map is basically a list of all the addresses in the memory system of where everything is. So program memory might be at, at address FFF000 and data memory might start at something like eight, you know, thousand. So you have to know that beforehand in order to use this, or at least your computer software has to know that, okay? But it's interesting because every port also is given an address. So your keyboard might come in on a specific address, your monitor might be uh, attached to a, a variety of different addresses, but they're all predetermined before, okay? All right, so that's a general overview of computer terminology and the terminology of all the things with respect to computer hardware in a modern computer. All right, we'll see you.